fastest growing channel on YouTube, The Outcast Creative. Creative. Hello. Uh, thanks very much for joining me on this uh, rather cold uh, London evening. Uh, but wherever you are in the world, uh, I hope it's uh, not quite as cold as it is in my office. I've got a fantastic guest tonight on what is Industry Interview 41. Can you believe that I started this channel ooh, about uh, a year and three months ago? So about 15 months ago, and I have done 41 of these 41 industry interviews already and i'm hoping to do at least another uh half a dozen uh this side of christmas now what's really exciting um about tonight's interview is this is a, a guest whose career i actually followed from uh day one because um i'm someone who lived through the time of the falkland um, island invasion um it was very much a part of my history uh growing up um, I was uh, in school uh, when all of that took place, of course, under the leadership time of Margaret Thatcher. There was a lot happening in the UK at that time. And uh, there weren't many um, dramas about the Falkland Islands because it was a bit of a touchy subject. Um, we had tumbled down, um, but then later on, uh, we had an ungentlemanly act, which uh, premiered one night, I believe, in 1992, late at night on BBC Two. And I happened to um, catch it, and it was directed by a man called Stuart Urban, uh, who is my guest this evening. And from that point onwards, I was always interested in anything that Stuart Urban was doing. Uh, and this was the reason that I also watched um, Our Friends in the North, uh, which is, in my view, one of the best um, British drama series ever made. Uh, and An Ungentlemanly Act is one of our best one-off dramas ever made. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be bringing in Stuart shortly before I do that. I just want to give a, a quick shout out. We've lost quite a few legends this week. And I just want to give a shout out to the actor, Richard Roundtree, who was in quite a few of my favorite films, especially some of my, um, favorite B movies. Sadly, he passed away today. We lost quite a few legends, uh, this week, including Bill Kenwright yesterday. And of course, Bobby, um, uh, Carlton, uh, footballer and I'm not a big football guy but um yeah these are all big people and uh of their time so um just a, a shout out to the late Richard Browntree anyway okay so uh without any further ado all the way from near the South Atlantic it's Stuart Urban thank you very much for giving up your time and coming on to see me yeah well thank you for asking me Lance oh I'm I'm the honors the honors all mine um now I, I, I there's a couple of things I want to ask you about. I don't I don't want to kind of go too much on a kind of I was born and I, I, you know all all of that. But um, you went to school in Kingston upon Thames. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah near but yes, uh, originally. Uh, and and, then, and how old would you have been from what and and what year to what year would that have been? And there's a reason I'm asking this, which I'll well, which I'll get to uh, in a second. In, in Kingston, I was up till 1972, uh, and then in Wimbledon. Oh, um, the King's College Wimbledon, the boys' school there. Yes, then in Wimbledon. Yes, the one near near the railway um, line near the common. Yeah. 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 Okay. So okay, so you were you were in you were at school in Kingston in the early 70s. I was yes. not working at the Kingston Cinema then, but I, I used to work at the Kingston Granada Cinema. Oh, yeah, I used to go there, yeah. Yeah, well, I'd, and I was trying to work out whether maybe you would have gone there the same time that I was working there, but I didn't start working there until 86. Oh, no, I was well out of there then. You were you were already well on your way to a career as a, a, a director. But, um, yeah. yeah, I was there when it was first a Granada and then later when it became Options. Now, now it's just a nightclub and... The cinema is no longer there, uh, but it's, there's another Shame. one down the road. So your brother, Mark Urban, has published a number of books on military history, including the controversial Task Force Black. 
you did an ungentlemanly act which is a some people think it's a controversial film i think it's quite an honest film um about i guess you would call it about the first 48 hours of the, the sort of the day before and the day of the falkland islands um invasion did you have an interest in sort of military history when you were young where did that where did those acorns come from well mark my brother who's uh, actually yeah, presenting newsnight tonight on bbc he uh, and i both did sort of do a lot of playing with action men you know so they're these dolls for those who don't know they're like soldier dolls the equivalent sure. of barbie sure. i'm not sure yeah they did make an action man movie i think years ago didn't get anywhere so anyway we we used to do like yeah, kind of war games or whatever but i also was very conscious of the fact that um, my father's family had been decimated in the holocaust and so you know the whole weight of world war ii and uh the nazis and um you know just just sort of that whole thing had an impact really the, the combination of factors so uh mark you know pursued a sort of military interest and actually joined the army for a while before university and i i stuck to playing soldiers on screen you know and and uh rather depicting some some things like the falklands war and the reason the falklands war appealed to me as a subject was uh we had a family some relatives in argentina um i therefore understood a bit of their side um i speak spanish you know grown up partly in venezuela so so to me it was uh like any war is very regrettable but particularly that one and also oh, yeah. actually mark well, at that time had he been um had they sent tanks he was in the royal tank regiment he he would have gone probably in the reserves he was reserves by then so uh luckily the terrain wasn't suitable for heavy tanks and um so all those things made me very interested in the war uh and um uh, i tried for some years to make a film about it one film was nearly made and failed uh to get made with canon and then hemdale the, the john daly the legendary producer of platoon great guy mm. he didn't manage to make it either um and then i made an ungentlemanly act for bbc um so the first stab at was this was this the same film that you tried to make with with canon did you was it an no, ungentlemanly act was it canon, it was uh it was with canon it was a uh, I had met some people who'd been in the Paris and um, it was dramatizing one platoon uh, as they got as they went down on on the on the transport ships and then fought their way through to Stanley. Mm. And it was about, you know, the squaddies, the officers, what was it like to be in that in that war in the middle of nowhere, which they'd never heard of half of them, most of them. And it was a different kind of film. It was more of a standard war film. Um, uh and looking at the price of war on on, on these people uh, whereas in the gentlemanly act i tried something very different which is to look at a community in the middle of nowhere as a sort of 1950s time capsule in a kind yeah. of ealing, ealing comedy that turns into a tragedy you know which is what it was yeah because i'll always remember the diary of adrian mole which um you might remember that book when it came out and there's yeah. a very famous line in 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 it and I, I read the original book i think it was published in the mid 80s and there's because the falkland islands war break it breaks out during his diary yes. and he said i'd never heard of the falkland islands uh, before i looked at the map to see where it was and i realized it was hidden under two breadcrumbs um, <laughs> in the south atlantic and that's why i hadn't seen it um yeah. And yeah, it's funny because I, I was quite interested in history growing up. I was sort of fed a diet of, you know, Where Eagles Dare and Battle of the Bulge and the Dirty Dozen and all those kinds of movies. So, um, I never heard of this island. I didn't even know we owned it, you know. Um, so it was news to me. Um, I, I, it was a, um, there's a, there's a line from Rosemary Leach's character in your film where she says, you, you know what are we fighting this for over bloody seaweed and penguins or something like this some yes. sheep over bloody sheep and and seaweed yes. that was it yes um, she, goes, yeah, she says sheep at any price then to, to yeah the, uh, the major Normans. to to, to bob like great bob peck um, yeah. um but i mean that kind of sums it up in a way and but then you have another line from um simon winchester who's the writer there for the sunday bloody times as he puts it in in the film um played by 
um, the wonderful was it Robert Jeffrey that played him? Philip Jeffrey is, uh, yeah. Um, who we just, just just mentioned him. He, Paul Jeffrey, sorry, Paul Jeffrey played him, Jeffrey. who sorry, tragically remember. recently pa passed away. Um, yes. But he says, and there's another line that that sums it up. The other side of it, um, if anybody come bothers to take it back for us, that is, oh, they'll bother all right if they want to stay in office, mm. Mm. and um, it becomes a a political. It be, it, the whole conflict became political capital for both sides, really. It was yes. political capital for Gautierrez to, to say to his people, look, I've given you something back that you haven't had for ages, so please ignore all the other wrongdoings I've been up to. And it was a political distraction for Margaret Thatcher, who at the time had quite a lot of problems at home. Yes. Um, with minor strikes and um, unrest and uh, hot, very high unemployment and infighting yeah. with her own party and lots of other stuff that's come out since with, you know, paedophile rings and this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's in, in a way, it, it, those that the people that benefited from it were quite lucky that it happened, really. And, of course, the people that were impacted by it which were ordinary people and ordinary soldiers. It's it's a very tragic story. I think your film encapsulates um, those arguments very very well. That's what I really one of the things I really like about it. Um, Thank you. you got to appear in the movie, which I didn't know when I first um, watched it until I read the interview about your diaries and and your commenting about running around with a radio pack on in the mud and this sort of thing. And I thought, oh my god, that was the director. Was that? Um, a, a sort of Hitchcockian decision, I'll do a cameo in all my own films, or was it more of a case of, well, we've got to take X number of actors to the Falklands with our budget. If I play one of them, that's one less. Well, it, it was definitely the practical reasons were, was a key one. I mean, it was also I did it for a laugh. But it's absolutely true that we couldn't get many Spanish speakers on the island. Uh, mm. there, there were a few Chilean fishermen whose accent is similar. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, although I speak fluent Spanish, it was more Venezuelan with a with a not accent that's like the accent's different. Anyway, I tried to learn the accent as best as I could to play this role, but it was because yeah, there, there were a few fishermen who turned up, and they they do appear in, in fact those people. Yeah, they're back, all chanting Argentina, yeah. Argentina on that. Yeah. And those those two guys in the background, the stills were uh, they were Chilean fishermen, um, right. and um, I was. It was fun dealing with all of the interesting backgrounds of people there. But, uh, but yeah, very few, uh, well, there were no Argentinians in 1982 when we made it. So, yeah, Chileans. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was it. But I also did it because I wanted to sort of try and see what it felt like to be there. You know, we were sort of wind and the rain and, and, and firing all these uh, weapons. Uh, it, it was a feeling of somehow being there in it uh, with the act with the actors but but re uh reliving it in the actual place in there you're looking at where it actually happened mm. very different to 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 you know i don't know taking i suppose some cameo which i haven't really done in apart from my, acting in my very early films as a teenager i haven't really acted at all or even cameos since then very i don't think so so um yeah but that's why i did it and uh, uh it was very difficult to do things like walking with that machine gun I, across the tr in a tracking shot uh, uh, and it gave me even more respect tr walking through the tracks and delivering the lines and, and loading the gun and so forth for actors for what they have to do and that's just business yeah. it's not really act that's before you get to any attempt at acting it's a very big technical no I, mean, I did I, I did a cameo playing a mercenary carrying a yeah. replica gun and all of this uh, uh, about 10 years ago whenever it was that we filmed it and um you know I thought this would be fun and it also meant one less actor on the shoot. And it was also overseas. After two takes of running around with that gun on our big, long tracking shot, I was knackered, absolutely <laughs> shattered. Yes. And I thought, God, yeah, this is this is exhausting, man. I think I lost half a stone that day of yeah. uh, filming. I probably should go and do it again now. Um, was it a, a conscious decision? Because I can imagine, okay, let's go back to 1992. Funding is not abundantly available in, in huge sums. I think the budget for the film, was it around $2 million? Is that right? 
a bit less actually i think it was uh probably 1.4 million obviously adjusted yeah. for inflation it would be right. yes some two um, and a million now i mean two and a half i you know um I don't know what what you pay to make such a film because it was made in a very special way, you know. In the yeah. Uh, so that's what I want to kind of talk about a little bit because a, lo a lot of my viewers will be um, filmmakers and people of that nature. Um, yeah. I, I imagine if you took this to a producer today, this, let's say the same script and pretend the film hasn't happened, they look at the locations and they go, well, can't we find a big private house in Cornwall that's on the coast and have it double for the house in, you know, uh, the governor's house. And surely we can, you know, shoot a lot of this on the Isle of Man or, you know, wherever. But you actually did go to, um, you know, you actually went down to to the Falklands. Um, and I vaguely remember from the diary something, it wasn't like a, you know, you know it wasn't a, um, a luxury flight. Um, I think you had to piggyback off some sort of cargo flight, didn't you, to get people? Yeah, there. we went down with the RAF. These old planes, these tristars. It was known as Crab Air by by the non the, the non RAF personnel, and um, we it was a very uncomfortable plane um, because that that they, they weren't you know the seating was was like metal frames, um, and uh, it, the heat there wasn't kind of standard heating. It was either on and boiling or it was off. Uh, and freezing it was a bit, it reminded me a bit of if you ever near the tintin cartoons when he's in the centrifuge yeah space man he's either boiling or freezing depending which which side they're roasting or freezing him and um it was a bit like that but you know it was actually we were very grateful to get down with with the raf because the governor of the islands governor fullerton was very kindly disposed towards the project unlike the government the british her majesty's government itself which were trying to do stopping us in every way but he even though part of the foreign office obviously is a, a colonial foreign and colonial office was um helping us by giving us the falcon islander rate on the seats which were more like a normal price seven or eight hundred what it was for a long haul flight instead right. of the crazy price that tourists and normal people paid uh which was in the thousands so we couldn't have done it otherwise so i, I shouldn't moan about the flight so i mean you took some of your cast there, but not all of them. And right. I was try trying to work out when I watched the HD version of it, which you very kindly sent me. And, and thank you for that. And it, it, it well, looks amazing, by the way. Thank um, you. It was so lovely to see it after 30 years, you know, restored from the actual yeah, film. Yeah. I mean, it, what a difference, God, because compared to my dvd which when you do put it on now some of the scenes do look a bit like those old episodes of crossroads you know <laughs> and and there's quite a jarring thing from one to another where oh that one looks great and then but yeah. it was very it was a very consistent now what you've got is a, a very consistent good quality print which is yes. fantastic yes and and you know let's try and get it out on blu-ray please um Yes, please. So I was trying to work out whether Ian Richardson and Rosemary Leach, who of course would have been your two senior actors, um, actually uh, um, went to the Falklands and did some filming there. And I was looking very carefully at the shots that you did. And I don't think that Rosemary Leach did. Oh, she I've... did. She did. Oh, she did go. Okay. She's in the garden clipping those roses. And well, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that bit, and I was trying to work out if it was a body double at one point, no, and then you cut right. to somebody else for a close up. And when and... they do the flag, um, when they do the flag, you know, when the Argentinian, the salute, the handing, taking down of the Union Jack, right. and raising of the Argentinian flag, she's there in that group. Um, yeah, that really happened, there. didn't it? That that really happened when they tried yes, to raise. It really people. happened. Yeah. I, and there's no incident in the film, however crazy, funny, or, or, or mad and sad, that didn't happen. You know, I mean, obviously it had to fictionalise in some degree, but that particular one happened, and you know, uh, it did. So you, so you, um, so uh, you, it's a fantastic cast, um, including several yeah. people that would go out or go on to become huge actors, like Adam Godley, who plays the junior yes. police officer. I saw him on stage playing the Dustin Hoffman part in the Rain Man stage adaptation yes. of Rain Man. Um, yes. Alongside uh, Josh Hartnett. Um, and he was fantastic in that, incidentally. Uh, then, of course, you, yeah, you cast... Yeah, great actor. 
he was great. I think it was in Fargo, a few other big roles he's been in. That's yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, Mark Warren, of course, w had a major role in Band of Brothers. I've I've bumped into him several times yes, over the years. And and uh, 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 Band of Hulk, he, he had so many series that he's led, the Mad Dogs. Indeed. Uh, um, did he go uh, to the Falklands with you? Yes, great guy. Yes, he was there. Yeah, because he's bombing about on the bike, and um, and then um, you see so you got Alex Alex Norton um yes. richard graham who is a, a personal favorite actor of mine fantastic richard, uh, actor yeah. who we're both trying to track down for an interview so richard graham if you yeah. see this please get in touch i'd love you to come on my channel stuart would like you for a reunion podcast we're both trying to find you um yeah um and and then i think you also have like a number of islanders that just kind of came and did bit parts um yes. like the ladies who stopped the land rover um yes. when it's right. raining you, i can kind of tell that they're, they're, they're not really actors but that all kind of works for the auth authenticity of the of the piece what was the most challenging aspect of filming in the falklands i mean was the weather always on your side How, what 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 well, were the... there were a number of things that that was sort of challenging. oh yeah the other actor of course who went on to big things aiden gillen uh aiden who gillen who's yeah you barely recognize him in it yeah, he, yeah, he's very young, really one of his first, very first roles. And, you know, he went on to the wire, all these big, big stuff and continually in big, big TV series. He's actually uh, in this yeah, scene he's, with, he's in yeah. this scene with Chris Walker. Is this interior in the kitchen? Is that a UK set? That is the UK set. And, and I my story so. all, there are shots, which sequences, which begin with a gun being fired on the real hill that they were fired at down, you know, at the government house where I was playing one of those Argentinian commandos, basically the bullet, then it, then it went through one location and into the studio. Uh, and then, you know, the next scene might have been in the actual garden of the, of the but it was due to fact here, for example, in this scene, you see there's a lot of special effects, bullets going off, all that kind of thing. Um, and therefore, you know, we weren't going to be allowed to do that in government house, of course. I'll play a few seconds of this just to give people an idea of the impact. Cool. And, and um, now I've, I've muted the sound because if I keep it on, unfortunately, what will happen is this video will get taken down. So, <laughs> but just to give people an idea, this is when the commandos are spotted coming around the back, um, and the editing on on this and and how fast this scene takes off, and and just the the, the level of the sound quality. Um, uh, of the whole firefight then unfolding is nothing short of amazing. It's one of the best um, action sequences in a modern film at that time uh, that I'd seen until we, you know, films like Black Hawk Down uh, came out and so on. I hadn't seen a modern drama uh, do a, a, an action sequence with that level of ferocity and realism um, at the same time. And I, I just thought, my God, this is great. And in some ways, I think after I'd seen this, I, I expected Hollywood to sort of come calling and give you a big action movie. Um, did, 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 I mean, did that ever happen? Did you get any offers of things well, that just didn't materialise, as is often the case yeah. in our industry? Well, yeah, thanks for your kind words. It was it was a big effort to make it like that, you know. And I did lots of things like, you know, go on a real range and, and, and fire, you know, heavy machine guns and see exactly what they impacts they didn't sound like which most people get wrong uh firing real tracer uh, as a test and then we copied it hand painted onto the film before mm. digital uh, effects and and some of the outgoing fire in, in in the beach sequences was real uh, was real tracer fire because we were firing it to see uh right uh, yeah see. yeah in the so, scene with richard graham in uh, yes. um, geordie yeah yes uh and aiden uh, so, so um, uh, yeah, I, I did go out to uh, Hollywood after the film, uh, Malibu to be precise, where I had an out of season. We had some offer from one of the top agents to go out, CAA. And then, you know, I sat there and they didn't get me the relevant, the, the, the things that I wanted. Um, and then I came back uh, and yeah, I couldn't keep my family out there forever. And, and uh, I had two young kids at the time. 
Um, and uh, so, I mean, they were very young. So, uh, um, so we all came back partly because I thought there was going to be a race war. It was also the time of the the uh, the LA riots. You know, the right? Yeah, very disturbing time. Yeah. And I thought, well, I actually don't want to bring them up here. But yeah, I came back supposedly to make my film about Robert Maxwell. Uh, right. And with HBO and BBC, and that got cancelled. Uh, um, so you know, filmmakers, you, it's it's difficult enough getting any kind of living, and then you, yeah. you start hopping about. You know, many people make the pilgrimage and stay in Hollywood. And, you know, uh, that that's what they do. And I, I, you know, with children, obviously, it's a bit different. You don't want to make them the victim of <laughs> victims. No, of no, age. no. And I, I think, I mean, one of the things I've I normally leave this discussion until the end of the interview so we won't jump on it too heavy now but i always do like to discuss with my guests um especially those that have been in the industry for a you know they've done their tour of duty as it were david mcgiff at first ad and i discussed this at length how mm -hmm. do you get that work and life balance there's not a great track record of surviving marriages in in our industry you know it's 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 a graveyard of um relationships and i know what i'm talking about yeah. um with oh, that yeah. well, my greatest achievement is being married you know for for 43 years and to the yeah. same the same woman uh so, so i mean that's like um i think know, that is i think that's an amazing achievement in uh, our industry that, not to be sniffed yeah. at. and of course many people they just anyway look that, that i've said my piece you know um yeah well but, um just going back to an ungentlemanly act, because I, I don't want to move on from it just yet. Yeah. Um, the casting, like we said in this in this film, is incredible. You've got the late, great Bob Peck there, who was an actor whose career yes. I've followed since I saw him in Edge of Darkness. Um, yes, a great actor. A, man, yeah. A, yeah, member of the company at the National. And um, and I was actually trying to do an interview with him um, when, when he got his tragic diagnosis of cancer, died relatively young. Um, yes. how did um, uh, what, what, what was the process for casting an ungentlemanly act at, at, at that time in 1992? Obviously, right. this is this is pre self tapes, yes. So, so I mean, at that point, you know, you always I always met the actors in live, you know, face to face casting wherever I could. Uh, uh, sometimes with the bigger parts, uh, I didn't. Um, uh, for example, Ian Holm was originally going to play the, the Rex Hunt, the Governor Rex Hunt part, which uh, he backed out of at the last minute. That's uh, right. That was in your diary. Yeah. And that's when we offered it to uh, Ian Richardson. I was actually in the Falklands in pre-production at that point. Um, and, of course, I couldn't meet him. And there were no Zooms or anything. So, so I was so happy when he said yes. But uh, normally they'd come in, you'd have a talk, you know, at that point. Yeah, you didn't even really have, um, yeah, you just about beginning of, yes, we had VHS tapes uh, just about then. or um, And um, we would sometimes watch something on tape or, or, or audition, or if they had theatre, then I'd read the reviews, or if it was on, I'd go and have a look. Um, so what, what kind of, you, you had a number of young lads, um, and then led by Pop Peck, you had the great Hugh Ross as well, who's a good good yes. friend of mine. Did you did you go out to the Falklands? Hugh was there. Yes, he was there. I, there um, doing the um, scene of, in wind and rain and the flag business. So I mean, did did any of your actors do a kind of a Saving Private Ryan, you know, they did. boot camp type they thing? Did. They, they, Major Mike Norman, the actual real Nor Make Major Mike, who who Bob Peck was portraying. Mm. took them all off uh, on on a boot camp um i would have gone but i i was i had a good excuse and i was far too deep into pre-production really getting ready to shoot uh, so they went off for about a week or two weeks uh and you can hear about that in a couple of the podcasts um which are uh uh history hacks and fighting on film yeah um, i love the guys from like, fighting on film matt and robbie are fantastic yeah, there were two great podcasts where the actors talked about, but two act twice I was reunited with the actors and, and fighting on film and the people at History Hacks uh, both helped, you know, kind of actually regenerate interest in the film and, and that helped lead to its remastered and restoration at uh, Britbox and ITV. So when, when the actors came 
back from that? I mean, was that something that they did on the Falklands when they came down for the shoot? Or they did a bit in both places. I think they're, they're in Britain, they went off somewhere, uh, some kind of training ground, um, and then uh, went, maintained their training um, with Major Norman of the Royal, formerly the Royal Marines. And, um, and then he was training and training them all the time in the actual terrain where it happened, you know. Right. So um, uh, when they were um, uh, like Chris Walker, for example, he's playing a, um, a veteran, uh, a real a real character, as I understand, yeah. who, you know, volunteered his services. There's that wonderful scene. An where... ex-Marine. Yeah, I think he's playing Jim Fairfax, if I remember. Jim that. Fairfax, that's right. There's that he's wonderful scene where Ian McNeese, Ian McNeese tries to get him to go home. Yes. And... Bob Peck just sort of elbows him out the way and says, see Cullen Sergeant Muir for a proper weapon. And then yes. he, gives, he gives Ian McNeese that look like, mate, as if we haven't got enough problems with you yeah. talking people out of helping us. Yes, um, exactly. They needed everyone they could get. Which is a, which is a really good, um, which is a really good moment. The, 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 you've got at the, on the titles at the end of the movie, there's a, um, a, secret, uh, a, a caption that says we appreciate the support of the Falkland Islands Islanders, even if they don't agree with the film's sentiments. Did were, were they upset at the way they? I mean, how did the movie go down there? Was there a screening of it there? Um, well, uh, actually, you know, at the time there were some sort of rumor mill that we were making fun of them or whatever because you know some of the details I put in, um, some people like got got upset by but when the film actually came out um the the general reception in the islands then and since has been very positive you know um and even today uh the commander of the british forces on the islands was inquiring about showing it recently the restoration they've watched it quite often it, so so absolutely w was uh, accepted um you know in the most part i mean obviously so we always get people disagree but but in the, I think they realised it was an affectionate portrait of, of a, a way of life and a community that was changed forever and vanished forever in some sense once the invasion came. I um, mean, they, they were, they, thank God, most of their lives were saved apart from four people. But they realised it wasn't uh, uh, mocking them. I mean, it was, it was in a way, you know, celebrating them and, and certainly no more mocking them than the Marines or the Argentinians. If you, I mean, everyone got some stick in it for whatever reason, buffoonery or, you know, um, whatever they did wrong, I, I had a laugh at, you know, so so it wasn't hostile to the islands and they realised that. G Gary Cooper, who plays um, Colour Sergeant Muir, he really felt like he had some ex-military experience. Was that the case with him? Gary was great, a great actor. He actually didn't want to take part in any of the training um and you know he was not very popular with the other with the actors who had to you know get in the mud and crawl on their bellies you know with blanks going off over their ears um he he was he he looks the part absolutely sounds the part he's a very good actor but he wanted nothing to do with you know the uh the nitty-gritty of, of the boot camp and i don't think that mike grady went to the falklands did he i did not actually uh, mike um a uh, lovely actor I've worked with a few times, not for a long time since, but uh, not for lack of trying. You know, I mean, you always have to find the right part. But he did not go because he was always stuck in the radio station, you know, as he portrayed Patrick Watts. Yeah. Want to go. Uh, and, you know, a lot, a lot of that is verbatim because it's him transmitting what we know is transmitted, including the songs. I think he plays it really well. Um, and, you know, I'm used to seeing him in, I forget the name of the, the, um, BBC drama thing that he was in was it Citizen so Smith? Comedy, Citizen Smith, that's right. Citizen played, Smith, yeah. And, and this was a, a was a really different role for him. And it, yeah, it's great. You know, in the meantime, here's some Montavani, and <laughs> just yeah. um, I, I I really liked his performance. And I noticed that you did that cutaway when the governor's leaving the island uh, with him and just a couple of other people, and they come and. And they come and sort of creep up to the taxi and wave goodbye. And the thing that gave it away that that shot's not in the UK is the tree that's in the, that's in the right. behind. Yeah, I spotted that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but because I was thinking, yeah, okay, you've got it's quite a big ensemble cast, and you can't afford to take them all. 
to the yeah, well, well spotted. There are a couple of trees in Stanley, but yeah, most most of the, yeah, yeah most of it has no trees. Yeah, um, I was thinking, how do you cut around that? And I actually think what you did was was really clever. Well, let's move on to um, my second favorite. Well, I'd actually probably argue it's my favorite of of the stuff that you've worked on, which is our friends in the north, which um, originally um, uh, was uh, or its genesis is from the stage play uh, written by Peter Flannery, which of which is a very the play was a very different animal. It only went up to a certain time period, um, I think from. 64 to 79 something like that um yeah. this is an epic television series the dvd of which is on the shelf behind me um that covers four friends lives uh from i think 64 to 96 it nothing like it had ever been on the television before not british television um where you had these lives that got entwined by historical events i'd never seen anything like it i watched it because your name was on it and i thought oh yeah great you know what's he doing now and um was blown away by it and it also completely impacted me as a writer i wrote a stage play that had a very similar narrative right after so it, you know it had a huge impact on on my my life um yeah how did you first become involved um and then i'll, I'll talk about some of the other logistical things and how right. did you first well, get to become involved? I had uh, come back from uh, LA uh, where I'd gone thinking we could make a film after that success of Ungentlemanly Act, um, but didn't want to hang out, you know, as the reasons I mentioned in, in, in race riots. And in fact, we actually drove through a shootout on the way to the airport, which I thought was a film being made, but was a real <laughs> shootout. <laughs> like, uh, you, you, can't make that, you can't make that up. No, it was on the Pacific Coast Highway, uh, the PCH. We were, anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah, I came back and I was supposed to make a film, my film about Robert Maxwell, based on the book by Tom Bauer, great, great writer of biographies of 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 a grotesque or important people, often both. And um, uh, we that film collapsed for legal reasons. The BBC pulled it at the last minute. Uh, could where, it? Could it be which, made now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything was, uh, in fact, in fact, with the uh, Ghislaine Maxwell scandal and yeah. all that, I was trying to update it with the same producer, actually, Kevin Loder, very top producer. We were trying to update it and, uh, not long ago, and uh, no one was interested. Uh, anyway, that's, that's it. So, so um, um, then that collapsed. BBC you know, it was often been brave, but often cowardly about making true stories. Uh, if there's any legal worries, um, mm. they uh, then offered me uh, uh, this script, uh, and it was very exciting, and, and, and you know, it was just phenomenal script. And um, I said yes, and, and went straight into directing that. In in uh, did you 19... did you read the entire thing, like all nine episodes, to, before you you you? Because it's I mean, it's a huge story. Uh, or did you just get you like know, the first um, couple? I don't think they were all ready at that point. Certainly, the first three were, uh, right. which I was, uh, you know, the first three or four. And then uh, it was always meant that Simon, Catherine Jones would come on for latter part to direct the, mm. the later part. And, and so I was setting it up as the first director. Yeah, and yeah, it was very right. exciting. And and were you were you involved with the casting process, yes. or were any of the cast attached before you came on? No, no, all, all these all these people I cast, uh, you know, in in conjunction with talking with uh, the writer and, and Charlie Pattinson, the producer, uh, and Simon, the other director, came on for some of the casting. But in essence, yes, that these were all people that um, that uh, Gail Stevens uh, and Andy Pryor, the casting directors, worked on with me in finding. Yeah, um, I mean they're two legends in their own right. Um, of, they in are the cast, in the casting world, and I mean this this show really put the spotlight on. I know Christopher Eccleston had done let him let him have it, but yeah. Daniel Craig, Mark Mark Strong, and Gina McKee, although they'd done a few bits here and there, were really largely unknown to the I would say to the British 
media that's right. public consciousness. Yeah. And this is the show that put them on the map. And I mean, what an amazing role for all four of these to have, because this is the sort of role that actors dream about. It's like an amazing character that has a huge arc that has loads of different ranging emotional scenes. So you're going to get to show your entire stuff. Uh, I mean, so before the show started, can you, was there anything different with the audition process on this one? How many people did you did you see for these well, roles? We saw a lot of people, including uh, other actors, became very well known uh, uh, for these four parts, um, who were also at the beginning of their careers. You know, we saw a lot of very exciting people. It was actually quite difficult. Uh, sometimes the one key thing was, could they do a Geordie accent? You know, which is which is pretty challenging um, for most people. Obviously, Gina uh, from. Durham is, is is pretty well near there anyway, and it's virtually a very compatible accent, so it was easy for her to slip into. Mm. Um, and uh, so it was it was a you know a long process that's for sure, and uh, a lot of um, you know callbacks and, uh, and and really getting into working who would sit best with whom you know in in that mm. cast, um, and working out yeah how they would go through the years and, and the roles um so it was um also a question of what what serious names could we get for uh big other roles like you know malcolm mcdowell who who came back to tv i think for the first time i don't know if he'd even done television before this um and uh, he played the gangster based on one of the west end gangsters um so so in soho so i mean you know, it was a really big cast and a lot of casting, meeting amazing actors who, uh, uh, you know, met most of them in life before. I mean, I think Malcolm was a, um, uh, he was living in America already. So I think we brought him over. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was an exciting process. Um, I've got a great and, picture of Malcolm McDowell. Um from the booklet which comes with the the dvd oh um, yeah I dare, I dare say he hated having that photo taken yeah. um and yeah i mean he plays a a fantastic um character um who's uh based on in in, in real life um because the you've got three key especially in the first three episodes which you directed there are three big characters they're all based on real historical people that had a huge influence yeah. in their own domains and that's yes, yes. T, T, T Dan Smith who Austin that's Donahue right. is based yeah. on John Edwards right. is, is based on the builder John Paulson um, yes and the real, real names couldn't be used because there were still legal things going on with yep. that at the time and then um the name of the um Soho guy I had it written down Ben uh, Barrett yeah the gangster I don't know yeah. who the real one was. I can't remember the name of the real one. Was it, it wasn't uh, Red uh, Phil He's Raymond. based on James Humphreys. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Benny Barrett's based on James Humphreys. And I mean, and of course, the police, who they, they were, the, the Dirty Squad, as they the were The Dirty Squad, yeah. You know, a lot of them I don't think could be named. Or whatever, all no, um, they were all, uh, and you, you had some wonderful actors playing them. And this is the this is the show that introduced me to Danny Webb, who yeah, subsequently Danny, yeah. I would work with and he would become a good friend of mine and still is. I've nice. also met Donald Sumter because of this show. Donald Sumter came yes. to see the play that I was inspired oh, really? to write because of this yeah, and immediately great. said, I'll work with you on anything you're doing. And that was really nice of him. Nice. I saw him in the queue, you know, queuing up for tickets and we were sold out. And I just went and grabbed him and said, well, I'm going to find you a seat. Don't worry. And um, uh, yeah, that was so and then you've got Alan Armstrong yeah. um, as Austin Donahue. Um, the late, great, oh, his name, Je Jeffrey Hutchins played. Um, yes. These are all powerhouse actors. Um, yes. Just a phenomenal cast that I yes. don't think could be assembled today. No. I don't Even know. with four unknowns in the lead, you'd never get 20 supporting actors of no. that kind of caliber in one. Good act, such well-known name. I mean, just great actors, yeah. So, uh, I mean, how much rehearsal time did you have with them before going in? Was there uh, any? Because it is quite a talking heads piece. 
Yeah, it, it was about uh, certainly a week or maybe uh, 10 days uh, at, at the what was known as the Acton Hilton, which is a BBC building in Acton. Uh, Hilton not being denoting a luxury <laughs> place. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember hearing about that place. Yeah, it was actually a great place. I mean, because, you know, you were you could isolate yourself from everywhere like Shepherd's Bush or White City, where the other executives of ever were. So, yeah, we had a proper rehearsal time. Um, with uh, Peter Flannery and and uh, uh, and the actors, it was it was great talking it all through. And did you get to um, rehearse with Peter Vaughan and Frida Dowie? Um, I don't who played Nikki's parents. Yeah, I don't think I rehearsed scenes with them. No, it was I mean the principals. Um, I, yeah, sometimes it was just talking rehearsals. You know, we just talk through everything. I, I don't remember sure. doing actual rehearsals with them. It was, uh, I could have, you know, it's whatever it is, 30 years ago nearly, so I may yeah. have forgotten, but... Uh, well, um, Chris Wilkinson had already worked with you on An, an Ungentlemanly Act, it was, and he, 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 of course, played one of the less, one of the new coppers who comes after the Dirty Squad in it. Was that, did he get cast because you had a relationship with him and you thought, I've got a good role for you here? Uh, which part was he playing? Or Chris, Not Chris Walker, you mean? Yeah, Chris Walker. Yeah. Sorry, not Chris yes. Walker. Yeah, he, he, who played Jim Fairfax in uh, yeah. John the Act. Yeah, he was one of the corrupt uh, uh, coppers. Um, and uh, well, one of the less corrupt. He, he's in yeah. the second generation of coppers that comes that's in right, after the right. first lot, but they they still don't really do anything. Yes, so he wasn't as bad as the, the no. evil David Schofield character and so on. Yeah, oh, David yeah. Schofield's character is positively evil in this. Yeah, uh, so so uh, yeah, he was another great actor lucky to get in it uh but yeah it was nice bringing some people from ungentlemanly act um chris uh and you know that they, they they it was a great it's just wonderful working with them all i mean you know there, there was not one not one thing that i remember going wrong or badly or that was upset or worried about with the cast it was it was just Fantastic. I mean, you, you obviously never know when you're making something, will it be a success or not, which is hmm. people often ask me, well, what was it like? You know, <laughs> things which I thought would be a huge success that weren't and vice versa. And, uh, um, you know, it, but but but, you know, we had we had it was a very creative, exciting time in terms of the cast. Or work in, in, in terms of a typical day um, shooting that series before we move on. Yeah, typically uh, was it shoot shot on super 16 is that right yes yes yeah so that was kind of like the in format to do yes. something that was a bit of a notch above tv but you couldn't quite go yes, to film. yes. Um, so it, was, it was actually 16 by 9 ratio but the bbc wouldn't transmit it in that at that point because they know their value for money on the license fee it would have meant a letterbox um yeah. so uh so it is one nice to see a transfer of that for it though um say again it would be nice to see a transfer yeah, in 16 uh, by 9 for our friends. Yeah, in the, I mean, North. The, the recent the Brit Box revival, um, I didn't watch it. I can't, I don't know if they re, I don't think they remastered, did they? Not like Ungentlemanly Act. I don't think so. No, it would have been um, a massive undertaking with all that film. With with Ungentlemanly Act, I was help, able to help them find the negative uh, with my, you know, right. sort of research hat on. Um, with um, with a, a friend of the North, I suspect by that point, it already moved to a lot of electronic posts that. So I mean, you're shooting on Super 16. You know, how many how many takes do you, well, get, um, do you give yourself? The first thing is you've got to. Uh, the first thing is it was period drama. Or, I mean, we never, we, it was 1993 or 94, but we were shooting uh, 1994. We were shooting um, what was supposed to be happening 30 years before, uh, mm. up to 20. I did you know, up to 66, 1964, 66, the three. So. Um, uh, we were shooting, so it's quite difficult, you know, with old jags and, you know, changing the streets and, and especially trying to do Newcastle at that time or Soho. Um, so normally with film shooting, film drama at that point, you'd be doing five minutes a day uh, of cut footage. And um, I think we were achieving, I mean, the, the, the challenge in this drama was uh, that there were a lot of scenes, with a lot of people in it, right? So yeah. Anyone who's a film student, you know, my first piece of advice is don't put too many people in the frame unless you're happy to do wide shots and don't move them around too much unless you want to have a headache doing your cover, the other shots. Mm. Of the scene. But um, 
so I, I developed a style of doing these uh, 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 scenes with, with, you know, often one as or one shot or wide shots uh, that uh, I composed carefully and would able, enable us to make the day, you know, to get through the schedule, mm. the amount of time that had to be done. Because uh, I was already quite experienced at shooting drama. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, a challenge, but it was it was you know it, ha it happened fine for me. I mean, uh, uh, I've had various sort of influences on my style. Um, obviously, the period whatever we could find from period footage, uh, some classic British work um, like Villain or uh, Oh Lucky Man, um, Bertolucci. Actually, I, I, I looked at a lot of his work. Uh, I definitely see the influence of villain on on yeah. this. We yeah. screened that on film, I remember, in Television Center in that one of the one of the screening theaters. We actually got a film print, it's very exciting. Um, so I mean, would you just in terms of numbers of takes, let's say you're shooting a, a you know, a yeah. scene with, with four of your principals. Yes. Um, or, or three even. Um uh, and you've done a cover wide or whatever. Yeah. How many, how many, how many takes are you going to give your actors when you're you've got super 16 is in your head is it like right i want to get one good one and another one for safety that's usually yeah, my obviously thinking. that point you know uh, for those who don't know and the film stock even on 16 mil or super 16 was expensive you know so yeah i know that's why that's why i'm off shot as much as they do now yeah. um and uh you know you 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 would uh uh you would watch the monitor uh, it, often or sometimes not have time if it was a really tight scene and shooting quickly or moving a monitor on close-ups. Didn't do that. So I would say it was normally three three takes, four takes. And right. uh, um, we we would have, obviously, again, depending on the size of the scene, the amount of people in the scene, um, I, would, I would not be afraid to have long shots and wide shots. Um, and... Uh, you know, this is a matter of style. So, so uh, um, for example, there was a press conference scene and I was one of the corrupt, uh, uh, you know, one, one of the corrupt people making a press conference in the, uh, uh, I can't remember which scene it was. It's, it, it's in the, fir the first episode where they're, they're trying to undermine Nicky Hutchinson, I think. And the, the press are just all asking stupid questions, but nothing about the relevant issues. Is that the one we're talking about? No, no. Uh, it's a later one with, I think, Alan Armstrong. Anyway, I filmed the... There wouldn't have been time to cover the whole scene, right? So right. I filmed the monitor of the camera in the st TV studio that was supposed to be filming the scene. Right, and I, right. And I filmed, panned another monitor, and then I had one shot of them. Uh, of the of the actors because there wouldn't have been time to shoot shoot all that scene from all the angles so that was the kind of style i was doing uh, which uh which uh which led to arguments actually you know with with uh peter flannery and um he wanted right. lots of close-ups just just close-ups of you know of of the uh the words um and my argument was you know we're making an epic this is the way I see this epic. If you want it covered, you want me to cover this and get through the day and, and film the amount that we have to film, given it's a period drama. This is how I'm shooting it. You know, as you see there, you have the Soho scenes, the dance scenes. You know, you can't you can't film a scene like that in, in standard amount of cover. Um, mm. So I picked on, you know, ways to introduce a scene to have something exciting within the scene. Like, like I talk, talked about that press conference. No, I remember a distinct argument. Oh, you filmed the monitor, not the, not the actor. But it was, it was perfectly well framed in the monitor. My whole point was it was it was about um, uh, uh, alienation. What was the truth? What was it? What you were seeing through the monitor was the guy telling the truth. You know, and um, I remember the scene you're talking about now, and it's the one where they where Arthur's being interviewed, that very old school Labour politician who they've kind yes, of wheel, wheeled out. I actually thought that, that the way that that was shot was really good. Um, and I think you're right. It, the problem is it, it was originally a stage play, and I, I understand Peter wanted the words to 
speak for themselves and all the rest of it and close-ups and so on. But, I, you know, I had two American guests uh, who've watched the show for the first time and I had to say to yeah. them, get through the first episode, get to know everybody. It, 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 it get, it's, a, it's got a much bigger feel by the end of episode two. And they all agreed on that point. And the, the show does need to look epic because it's an epic story, but it is told through yeah. a kind of talking yes. heads narrative. And, and so you've got to do everything you can to make it look bigger. Yeah, and while, of course, um, you know, Peter wrote a great script, uh, it is obviously the director through the director's eyes, how you have to shoot it and, and make it work within your vision of a script. And, yeah. um, um, you know, he, uh, I remember talking about that issue, close-ups and so forth. Um, there was a very funny moment, uh, incredibly funny, when when Malcolm McDowell and, and uh, Daniel Craig were with me in a big, wide scene in what was the deserted, abandoned Battersea power station. Um, right. I don't remember it and, and it's a gangster rendezvous you know uh and i just stayed wide and the incredible thing was that malcolm said to daniel and we we're picking this up on the headphones right uh and i was having arguments at that point with 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 the uh, producer charlie and peter about you know about the style and so malcolm said to daniel craig have you seen any of the rushes and he said yeah he said, I love it how Stuart is staying wide on these kind of sequences. It's very exciting and not just resorting to standard TV master close up, close up. Yeah. I started laughing with the continuity person. We were laughing at each other and really started laughing and like got a good thumbs up from Malcolm. And um, um, Danny, Danny went behind, behind me. Was Charlie, Charlie, Charlie Patterson was behind me, who also heard what was said. You know, but anyway, it, it, you know, that, that look, yeah. you know, in later life, you learn that there are there are various ways to skin a cat. You know, there's no one right way or wrong way to film something. You know, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, I, I've always um, uh, you know strive to do something that is different and make every shot interesting. You know, where, where sure, it's... yeah. Well, um, making every shot interesting might be a good segue for us to jump onto a uh, preaching to the perverted. Um, which certainly has a lot of interesting shots in it. Um, uh, some people won't be as familiar uh, with that film on your CV because it kind of came and went in English cinemas, caused a bit of a stir um, in terms of um, annoying some people and um, uh, rankling certain areas of the establishment, which I think it was, was exactly who it was poking fun at and you you kind of have a bit of that narrative um in our friends in the north where the the very people who are uh having a stab at soho and um jeffrey um uh the 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 actor who plays the overall metropolitan police commander i think it's um uh, i just worked with his daughter i just directed his daughter in a play um jeffrey yeah. somebody um, somebody Jeffrey. He's on your show reel. Uh, um, no, he means. Sorry, I'm just trying to find out. P Peter Jeffrey. Is it Peter Jeffrey? Peter Jeffrey. Peter Jeffrey yeah, lo lovely actor. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's in the show. He's there at the strip club. Yeah. All that yeah. Stuff. And he, he sort of ends up getting kind of seduced by the very thing he's criticizing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, As did some of the police investigating the fetish yeah. clubs. So they're, they're absolute similarities. And of course, for anybody who has seen both things, that my dance sequences and the club sequences in uh, our friends of the north are, you know, you can see where I, how I then how I developed the uh, show, the stage shows in Preaching to the Perverted, which, yeah. which are quite similar yeah. in terms of style and color schemes and so on. I mean, so um, yeah, um, well, it's, and the, the color scheme in Preaching to the Ver Perverted is very poppy. It's it's it's, it's yes. you know, and you use it to to when we cut to the scenes with the do-gooders, the color palette is completely different. It's it's yeah. a totally total contrast, which I really like. I mean, what that's an interesting topic. What what what, what drew 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 you to that? Because that's one that you wrote, directed, and produced. Yes. Um, well, so you, um, you, had, you had you you had total control on that. Yeah, one. I'll tell Why you why that. It was a BBC drama originally about sex addiction, right? Uh, right. Nothing to do with the fetish scene, and. Um, 
uh, I, you know, I was, uh, they commissioned the script. Well, I thought, I was beginning to think, actually, you know what, this sex addiction, which was a big story in the mid-90s, early 90s, this is, imagine, this is the first time the term was used. And I had an idea of a man who, who infiltrates uh, one of the 12 step type programs for addicts and it didn't quite work uh, and then I, I i was what was happening around london that time uh, in particular where the fetish scene was really exploding these really stylish cra crazy clubs and dance music was bursting out of them and i visited them a few times uh, which was not related to this project but it was so exciting i thought you know what let me try and blend them together the idea of an infiltrator. Oh, yeah. The other big point was that they were um, being prosecuted, you know, by moral crusaders, the police, um, Christian groups, whatever, trying to shut down these clubs. Like, this is ridiculous. You know, these are consenting adults. And it's actually, uh, you know, a lot of kind of fashion uh, world was there and, you know, mixed with gay clubs. And I thought it was so, it was so fascinating. And performance art. I said, someone has to make a film about this. No one had. So that's how I had the idea of the infiltrator into what was technically a legal club uh, who falls for the person he's supposed to prosecute. Um, so in terms of, yeah, because it really reminded me of like, the, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the fashion label Cyberdog that's in Camden. They've got that big shop and it's all like dance yeah. clothes. And yes. um, if you haven't been there for a while, you need to go. The shop is really updated. Um it sort of reminded me of that that world meshed with s m and fetish and all of that which of course now in the uk is a, a massive scene with clubs all yeah. over the place of covering and the everything. goth world also was exploding and so, so I'm, i was mixing them all together you know i mean they were mixed yeah you know, they were at the same clubs but this was this was still uh, this was kind of still mid mid to late 90s so it was it was it wasn't the it was still fairly taboo Back yeah back yeah then. it was it was and prosecutions were going on there the other big thing which influenced the film was the prosecution of very hardcore uh gay S S bdsm practitioners the spanner case which was an outrageous case of consenting men who sent videos of them doing pretty extreme but you know non non-fatal certainly and non-lasting injuries in the pose to each other and they were they went down to prison for enormously long sentences and one of them died you know either in prison or soon after i thought it was the most outrageous case uh, which in the end went to the european court and still as complicated british law uh, i mean they haven't really got consent to do these things but anyway i thought well you know if that's being put on as a show trial we have to make fun of it and show that the law is an ass you know yeah uh, which is what i hope we did you know i mean even the real judge was called Judge Yell. And so I called him Judge Rant in the film and used his actual words. <laughs> no no one, apart from the, the censor, James Furman, telling me I was mocking British law, I said, yes. <laughs> I said, he, he, he was really annoyed that it was the real case. I said, well, you know, I don't think they'll sue. Um, and they didn't. But uh, a lot of it, you know, although it was played as a fantasy film, uh, you know, it was a lot of very serious stuff in there. Which, of course, as you said at the beginning, a lot of the press just didn't get at all. Um, yeah. I remember The Guardian at the time called it, called it execrable. But, you know, guess what? 25 years later, whatever, it joined their list. Um, uh, this time the female critic um, uh, as one yeah. of the 10 best about alternative sex ever made. You know, so, so you know, uh, plus a change, it, it, it has been largely restored critically uh, but at the time yeah it was certainly true that the, 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 it was more, mostly the, the kind of edgier press that liked it but some some critics in the traditional press also liked it mostly they didn't uh, and it's found but, a, uh, um, a bigger audience since how did you go about yes casting the lead lady in 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 this because it's quite right. you know she's basically it. So playing a dominatrix a very difficult role to cast. I went, uh, um, you know, the BBC had backed out. Then we had backing from Nigel Green and Trevor Green, who are two great British distributors. To, uh, Trevor died a couple of, a year or two ago. Um, and they put in the money. So then we had the money. And we knew we had some money to make the film. Uh, or they put in the important 
first partner with an equity investor. So I had the money to go to Hollywood to look for American actresses at first, absolutely uh, blacklisted uh, by uh, even the Playboy agency. You know, that was that was the time when they were doing um, these kind of uh, uh, erotic thrillers and other stuff that were quite mainstream and quite acceptable. Yeah, they turned up sort of late night, night on Channel 4 at 10 o'clock and were... That's right, yeah. Shannon Worry. Uh, Red Shoot Diaries, you know, yeah, even actors yeah. who were quite well known, uh, like uh, uh, Mulder, you know, the, the what's his name, David yeah, Duchovny. Get, Duchovny. Get, A lot of people were in these films, but no yeah. one would. I mean, literally, Playboy. I, I met a couple of them, uh, the actors, but then they weren't really allowed to go further. Then I discovered uh, that Go Fish had been made. This was the, one of the first lesbian indie films. Uh, by Rose black Trish. and white. I, I I saw that yeah. in Nottingham at their shots in the Dark Festival. Right. So so yeah. I thought, wow, this this lead actress there, Guinevere Turner, she's so exciting. Um, and we sent her the script in New York, and she said, yes, it's this great. She sent me a fantastic. Now already now video did exist. She sent me a fantastic audition tape, and I went to see her in New York um, to you know talk it all through because obviously very you know. Uh, you, you, uh, unlike some directors, I would never push people into doing what they didn't want no. to do. Uh, There's a lot of very sensitive stuff to film, and so we talked it all through. And uh, Gwyn was great, and you know, and 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 uh, it was, it, she was wonderful. She, you know, she comes from that sort of uh, one of the rare out lesbian actresses in in america uh, in the mainstream or relative mainstream but she went on to do uh the l word and and, and you know and write uh, mm. co-write um, some of mary harron's films like american psycho and so forth so she's she's a big creator in her own right but she was fantastic in this film and she really even people who didn't like the film liked her and christian anholt very much anyway lovely cast in the film they really wonderful actors my my thing when people hammer a film I often say to these people who are critics, well, not that I engage with them particularly, but I said, look, if a film has such good actors in, it means <laughs> it means that whatever you think of it, you know, the people making it were inspired and felt it was a good film because mm. you cannot attract actors to a shit script, you know, who are of high quality, like the people we had, uh, Tom Bell, Roger Lloyd Pack, you know, Sue Johnston, yeah. Ricky Tomlinson. They were... Keith Allen, fantastic actors, you know, who would never have joined it if, if they thought it was what some of the critics later said it was. But like I say, in the long term, it panned out, it became a cult film, you know. Yeah, you did a cameo as a postman there, which I... That is I true, yes. Spotted with, <laughs> Keith, Allen, with Keith Allen as the milkman. Um, yeah, which, Keith Allen, very funny. What was the... I mean, you've got some pretty big and complex scenes in this obviously for the dance numbers and stuff you would have had a chore choreographer and that kind of thing yes but, but for these sort of the, the the fetish club sequences i imagine a lot of people in those scenes probably came from that world was like a, a, a yes, flyer put yes, out to ask people to come and take part or how did that all they, they, we put out a call we had various people who understood what i was trying to do in this scene uh like uh, Tim Woodward of Skin 2, um, oh, yeah. some of the you know, people from the magazine and the, the club world who knew what I was trying to do um, and understood the script uh, and that it was um, not, uh, unlike most of these Hollywood films, including Tarantino's, that portray uh, people in leather or latex as, you know, gimps, killers and, and perverts. <laughs> well, this is a kind of case of, uh, the opposite, you know, they're, they're the goodies in the film. So, so of course, it did attract um, many from the real scene, uh, the fetish scene, gay scene, or the gay leather scene, you know, the, 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 the dyke leather scene. I mean, it was great having all these people, uh, the trans scene. I mean, there were so many people in the film from the real underground uh, yeah. that it had a street credibility, you know, because they were, these were people who wouldn't have appeared if we were taking the piss out of them or being hostile you know they knew what they were doing it mm. was sometimes difficult like right? if they'd all come from a club night a lot, there were a lot of them on ease it was actually quite difficult filming at time but uh but that's you know that's what you <laughs> get that's when you're trying to do something real 
uh, you've got to you've got to uh, make some compromises. You know, it, it was the height of rave culture when you you, you it was it there. was so that there that was. doesn't we, we had to so, um yeah we 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 were distributing energy drinks and thinking the end to counteract the effects of right. Uh, of right. these or stuff to keep people up you know it's a yeah uh Gurana drink that's right i can't remember what his name was it was outrageously strong it was like red bull but five times stronger you know um <laughs> but, uh yeah it was um fun. well that, where fun. can people see that uh, is it still is it available anywhere for people to watch yeah, because it's mean, only authorized but it's a film that was by the way in the top 500 of of the pirate bay those assholes, you know, from Scandinavia who destroyed, you know, okay, they attacked Hollywood, but they also destroyed the positions of people like my independent filmmakers. If there was a film mm. that their fancy, and uh, whenever I appear at film festivals, there are a lot of young people around. I said, please don't pirate a film, you know. Uh, and I got booed and hissed a few times when I said that I would have actually locked them in up and, and thrown away the key and given them much longer sentences. These people, because they are robbers. And yeah. anyone who leeches your IP, you know, is is out. You know, it's it's, it's an outrage. Anyway, ran over. Um, uh, the way you can see this film authorized is um, no, we no longer sell the DVD or Blu-ray. It's no longer, I mean, commercially viable. Um, but it is available at. Um, I, I can either go straight to the streaming, uh, you know, site, which is watch, as in watching. Watch.preachingtotheperv.com. Watch.preachingtotheperv.com. You can stream, rent very cheaply, or download, or the luxury version with all the extras ever made. Um, or at preachingtotheperv.com, you can also reach it. Uh, so that's the only way that you can see this film uh, legally, and 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 in the proper restored version that you see there in the trailer, the HD. From the original 35 mil film, which the fans paid for, is the first film restored on Kickstarter, the crowdfunding program for, for the arts. Uh, and uh, yeah, the first European movie restored by its fans. Thank you very was much. That, was it the first time you'd shot on 35 millimeter? Uh, it was. It was the first time on 35. Uh, and uh, no, oh. actually, I'd shot some of the uh, ungentlemanly act on 35, the battle scenes. Anywhere where tracer bullets were flying and the combat scenes, because it was hand rotoscoped, hand painted tracer fire. Right. It was before digital era. I had shot 35, um, but not a lot of it. So I didn't do, ever do commercials, which at that time were 35. That that explains why the the night battle stuff on Ungentlemanly Act has that has a real grain to it. Yes. And that the other scenes don't have. Now you've explained that. That that that's makes what? perfect sense. Yes. Okay. Right. Right. Because that's much more noticeable on the DVD transfer that I've got. The the contrast between the two. No, that's where... interesting. Yeah, of course. And it, it's a very interesting technical aspect. Like today, sometimes they might spend a lot of CG money on CGI, but if the transfer, you know, if the if the uh, the uh, master is not properly done on transferring to streaming or Blue, mm. but it can look terrible because they've done the wrong kind of uh, settings. Um, so anyway, that's no, sure. a problem. Um, are there, there's two other projects which I want to talk about that, but that you've you've um, produced, uh, directed, um, both which touch on areas of true crime, which um, yeah. especially now with the advent of true crime documentaries on platforms like Netflix and stuff, are some of the most popular shows and it has to be said that there's been some absolutely incredible ones i mean don't f with cats you know who would have thought that that would have been or well, tiger king would have been uh mm. two of the most popular documentaries ever made but they are it has to be said they're both extremely good and i remember that one of the ones that i uh watched in lockdown was um the updated documentary and i've seen them all um about the disappearance of Susie Lamplew and um, anyone who kind of lived in southwest London at that time I, I you know I'm from Kingston upon Thames originally which isn't a million miles away from um, the area where uh, you were living um, at the time um, yes. you, you know we all knew about this this case it was all over local and 
national news and for anybody watching who doesn't know it's a terribly um tragic case about the disappearance of a young um it's a beautiful uh, estate agent who went to meet a mysterious man and completely vanished and there's competing theories about what happened and who's responsible and in recent years there's been evidence leaning towards um a serial killer who's already serving time for another murder called john canan and god forbid that that man should ever be released i i, I really hope he he's never released um, um especially having seen the recent interviews with him and things in prison i just watching him says a chill up my spine um you've in the documentary and i i watched some of your interviews on this you you were drawn to to an interest in it i guess for the same reason that i've always followed the case you know you were local to the area it it, it sent the fear up you know we all had kind of girlfriends and things that we were saying oh be careful um it made it was a it was a case that made everybody so much more wary about stranger danger and all of that yes. kind of thing my yes. first question to you is bearing in mind your previous work and then also the fact that you'd done the secret and stuff did you ever consider taking on the story as a more traditional sort of you know four or six part drama with uh, uh, and i i guess maybe the the issue with that is how would you make that because the protagonist really is the person who disappears and all yeah. the other characters are in their orbit um maybe right, that's right. the challenge well, i i would never it's a good question and my answer is very quick and straight is uh, with such a mystery um where where even the facts of how she was taken are completely disputed and utterly clouded and mysterious as viewed by say opposing policemen on the same case who were there at the same time they both took completely different views of what happened mm. uh and you don't have an answer then it would be all commercially probably pretty impossible to do i mean traditionally true crime anything is made a film or television drama about a true crime it normally requires some kind of resolution you know and yeah there was that uh for example there was a film which i thought was one of his weakest not the way it was made it was brilliantly made that was it david fincher who did one about the the, ser the serial killer in Los Angeles, which had no Son of Sam. Uh, no, um, the, no, the, no, 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 uh, no. The Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac, Zodiac Killer. killer. Yeah, uh, my friend, my friend Donald Logue is in that movie. Oh yeah, yeah, good, good name. Fantastic um, actor. It, 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 it was a complete. You know, come on, man. You can if you leave an audience open ended like that. You know, it's all right to make a mystery that's fictional. So yeah. I, I, the mystery of Susie Lampley. No, I never thought of doing it as a drama because, um, uh, yeah, because it, it as as of yet it doesn't have an ending. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, that's right. And the ending, and obviously, it was a famous case with a ton, uh, thousands of podcasts and, and 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 books and stuff about it. Well, more with the podcasts and you know the meme world and so forth. Uh, and and um, uh, it's as mysterious as a case which has occurred just around the corner the killing of <clears throat> Suzanne Dando the recently right. Netflix series yeah so this was sky crime and um you know it was offered to me uh, as a geek uh, uh you know it was a time when people were not really making many dramas because of the lockdown mm. and COVID. so it was made in lockdown conditions but it was I think an important subject to tackle in a way that you know one could do then uh i think that you were asking me before i mean the man who who is the main suspect john canan who you mm. mentioned um who certainly believed to have committed at least this and one other murder which make him a serial killer yeah. um, was uh up for parole this year but his outrageous sort of lack of remorse and refusal to consider for the convicted offences that he was you know liable and guilty properly charged as there was an overwhelming amount of evidence has meant fortunately he's not going to be released for the moment yeah i mean he, he yeah and i'm i have to say i'm quite pleased with that result um do, i mean i've tackled quite a few um you know uh, things in 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 
not quite the same realm, but 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 not far out. I've done plays about um, Hillsborough, the Marchioness disaster, and my Northern Ireland thing. The first mm-hmm. act is all about Bloody Sunday. Yep. These are difficult topics where us as creators, we're kind of we're intruding on the lives of real people, and and I've always tried to do that with the greatest care and respect respect and approach them with very transparent hands i did it recently actually with the the play i've just done about the the post office scandal and i don't think anybody like like us goes into a a subject like this wanting to have anything but the best outcome for those people who are still living with it and uh, one thing, and there's been a few documentaries about it, but one thing that struck me about yours, and I, I think very much to your credit, is you made sure that the person who really got the most screen time in it was Susie Lamplew. There's a there's huge detail about her as a person and a, and a sense yes. of who she is that we've not really had before, I felt. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and the family obviously were in, improving. Well, involved. that well, yeah, and and it's still very difficult for them. I know that the brother took yeah. part, but the sisters well, didn't. What what was their response to having seen the well, film? Well, yeah, Richard, the brother is sort of elected the, you know, spokesperson, and obviously the parents died, and yeah, the poor brother, uh, didn't she died, you know, in dementia, and not knowing really if she was, let alone what happened to her daughter. So it's a terrible overall tragedy. Mm. Had many. Um, ripples out more than ripples and terrible impacts on on the family um so so we were trying to look at the case um obviously from the point of view who who done it you know was it yeah and a mystery and also the third part was trying to give her her due uh, to remember susie lemplu in a way that a lot of the true crime sort of standard one hour documentaries wouldn't have had time for Whereas this was two hours. Yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, and what 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 was the response from the brother once they'd seen? Or I mean, I don't even oh, know they, if they, they did. Uh, uh, Richard, yeah, he was very supportive. Um, you know, uh, there had been a bit of nervousness at the first because we were asking a lot of questions. You know, uh, I had a very good um, researcher, Charlotte Riley, Rowley, uh, who who was going in. You know, with a lot of serious questions, including to some former partners of Susie um, mm. and uh, there had been another documentary it was already underway which we didn't know about um, and so they were a bit fed up but but no when they came around pretty pretty when they realized you know it was a responsible team and Steve Anson the exec producer a very uh, high standard of work that he's done and, and uh, you know we, <clears throat> we got their confidence in the end good yeah, well, I think the results um, speak for themselves. Did you, certainly for me, on some of the things I've worked on, I've found stuff out and I've gone, God, you know, and this isn't even public. Um, were there any nuggets that you you got from this mystery or percep- per- yeah. perceptions that you didn't have before, things that had happened that you didn't know before? I mean, I didn't know that there were two. Yeah, I mean, there were about private life there were yeah i mean which i uh, can't really go into no um, okay yeah, sure would, so i mean they were not germane to i mean you know there are aspects of the relationship with john canan if if that was the killer and, and my general conclusion is probably he was um mm. who did go after very similar types as his victims yeah uh, blonde professional women white women uh, middle class or upper class um, well, not necessarily, but whatever, you know, attractive, blonde, professional women, uh, nicely dressed women. I mean, so so there was stuff about Susie's life, which we, we just chose not to not to go into, but um, uh, which uh, and, and some of the rivalries between the police and the family, which yeah, right, the tensions, you know, yeah, when I mean, you can understand how the parents how hard they fought as any would um and i don't think we're in any way to blame i think the blame lies with some of the original police work so so yeah i mean we didn't go into everything so as not to cause more hurt no. yeah sure um, yeah 
I mean, but what well, I suppose more what I was driving at was were, were there any kind of facts about the circumstances, particularly on the day of the disappearance, that through the course of your um, research for the program, you became aware of that maybe you weren't aware of before? Uh, yeah, well, there, there was, there was, as, as the program ends, I mean, there, there, there's some very credible stuff that came forward years later, including the eyewitness who saw someone dump what looked like a body in the grand in the canal yeah i can't understand why that hasn't been followed up uh, and the canal hasn't been the, dragged it's entirely possible the way police records were you know many other cases where people went in and there's no record he went into the nick the local police station and did say listen i've seen this guy dumping the description matched john canan who who's the main suspect but was never prosecuted and um uh they didn't you know there wasn't the funds or inclination or resources to dredge the canal when it came out a few years ago uh around the time we made the program so so we did have one big surprise and like i say i mean they, they, they it could be that the body was disposed of there um i mean it would but, still be there wouldn't it if well uh we looked into that and whether whether underwater drone or dredge you know probe could could get there but they weren't able in the end i don't think enough funds were put together um I may be wrong, but by the time I left the project, it, it wasn't possible to do. Um, it seems incredible that, that, that the answer could be right there, and it's just an expense. I mean, I know they've done various searches. Yeah, at, the police certainly didn't feel they should do it. No. Uh, it would have been expensive because it wasn't exactly, which you know, we knew more or less in the program, like within a few hundred metres, 100 square metres. So I wouldn't have thought it would take that long to probe. But no. Of course, uh, even in a suitcase, I suppose that might have. I don't know whether whether you'd find the bones. But anyway, it's very miserable. Dif dif difficult but, to uh, difficult to know um, yeah. how much. Well, that was the, the, that was the main practical thing that we found out uh, that that one could discuss. You know, I mean, did uh, so prior to this, I've kind of done them in the reverse order, but I, I wanted to make sure we gave Lamplu uh, a shout out because I, I just think it's it's. It's important to keep it in the press whenever possible, as as the family haven't got their answer, um, and to mention that suitcase. And personally, I think someone should get off their ass and pay for that, and and you know, yeah. see if we can give the family some closure. Um, and if someone would step forward to pay the expense, I think that would be a fantastic result for them. So, That's but you did, um, uh, I think again, this is very much your project, the one with. James Nesbitt, more recent in yes. 2016, um, yeah. the secret. Yes. Uh, uh, the secret. How did that? How did that come about? Why did you choose that? Quite an unusual um, case. I was not familiar with it um, yeah. and, and, well, until. Let me tell you that normally that ITV and BBC, uh, you know, the two main broadcasters in Britain, and to a certain extent, Channel Four. They all just want to cover the same old bloody story normally. It's another Brinks map. It's another Yorkshire Ripper. It's another angle on, you know, they're almost <clears throat> always notorious cases that have been done loads of times, which personally, mm. yeah, I mean, okay, you know, if you think you should make another one about that. Well, I'm much more interested in cases that are so unusual and so gripping that they give you a ask questions about human nature and the psychology of a killer that you would not get by endlessly dragging over the coals of the Yorkshire Ripper case or or the Brinks Matt or the Great Train Robber. I mean, the ones that they yeah. keep making, the Essex boys, you know, the, the Essex <laughs> murders. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. They keep making these. Whereas the secret, three lots of filmmakers have tried to make the Adoption Derek Henderson, the author of the book on which I based most of the work on this, yeah, drama, um, had tried and failed, including an uh, Oscar nominated writer and, and an Oscar winner, actually, uh, Irish filmmakers. They hadn't found either the right approach or the right actor. Uh, in fact, they hadn't even gone to James Nesbitt, who is the obvious man to play Colin Howell, the dentist, the double fantastic the performance from, from Jim yes. Nesbitt in this. Probably it's his great. best. His best. Amazing, I, said, Derek, I, I think so. I, I said to Derek, "Isn't this, you know, has your father lived on the actual route where um, the uh, 
so, sorry, this, this James is it James Nesbitt's father lives on the actual route where the killer ran away at Port Stewart, uh, near Port Stewart. I think that might be, the, I think that Castle I think Rock. I might have read that, yeah. And and he said, yeah, it, it is Castle Rock is J Jimmy Nesbitt's dad, and Jimmy's really interested in this story. I said, really, <laughs> and so I I managed to option the book and get it to James Nesbitt. Uh, and he said, yeah, he was in, you know, I sent him a treatment. We didn't have the money for the script. And then um, uh, we went to see ITV with the producers with Hat Trick. And they were in right away. You know, it was one of the quickest in my life. It's the quickest turnaround I think I've had between getting a property and getting it to the screen or getting a script to the screen. It was within a year, which is like sensational, you know, to to um, to achieve that. Um, it doesn't did, normally did, happen. Did, did the lead principles again? I mean, this is far and away from an ungentlemanly act and our friends in the north where you said you had a week's rehearsal and so on. Much rehearsal time for this because it's great. Well, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't because I didn't direct it. Um, whereas I always work with the writer, uh, mm. I worked with Peter Flannery, you know, before we had our differences. I mean, certainly invited, I'm very collaborative and always invited writers where, where there are, you know, when it's not like fast turnaround episodic television. Where it's proper dramas like this, I've always invited the writer, and I was not invited by Nick Murphy and and uh, Mark Redhead, the director and exec other executive producer of this series. So, you know, uh, they told me there weren't going to be rehearsals, and there were. But that's the TV, that's the TV business for you. So I wasn't involved in that, but I, I was certainly, uh, you know, involved in the casting and, um, uh, you know, having my input. And I, and I cast James Nesbitt, of course. So, so uh, why, why did you decide not to direct this one, just out of interest? Oh, it wasn't a decision of mine. A, a, there wasn't really time. I was writing it as we were entering pre-production. The other episodes hadn't been written, and uh, Mark Redhead wanted someone else. But, but it was more that I just didn't have time, you know. Otherwise, I would probably have just uh, said, as I normally do, that, you know, I work as a writer and director, and, and uh, I, I will direct this. Or well, no one will, but I mean, it's like um, I didn't want to stand in the way of of the the uh, production, of course. So, so, and it was like I said, made in a big hurry. I couldn't do everything, and I wouldn't. No, want to. sure. Uh, yeah, no, you. I mean, and also, I think when you're older, you realise time is precious. Absolutely, and, and you, you you choose things in a more exactly. careful order and. Exactly, exactly. You know, one of the actors that's in this, I've got to tell you this story quickly because I've only just realised it, is Patrick O'Kane. Yeah. And um, when I wrote um, oh, yeah, Sticks yeah. and Stones, my, my play about Northern Ireland, which I, you know, as yeah. I, I call it Our Friends in Northern Ireland, wherever it is. Um, yeah. I had a main villain and I always wrote it with it being a TV series in mind. And yeah. I... I I wanted the villain to be played by Patrick O'Kane. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll call that character Patrick O'Kane. And um, <laughs> that way, further down the road one day, he'll know I wrote that role for him. And in for the him. cast list, there it is. Oh, Patrick great. O'Kane as yeah, one of the characters. Totally. That's kind of... Yeah. Uh, so you got, to, you got to work with him. I saw him on stage in Popcorn with... Danny Webb, how, uh, I mean, well, you were producing rather than directing um, the show, yes. but uh, yeah, did you I get to really see him in action on, on, on set? No, no, I, I didn't go to the set. Uh, I, I preferred not to be, you know, I didn't want to be like Peter Flannery in the hair of the director and telling them what okay. to do. Okay, so you were, you were, uh, it was a, you, you put the project together, you wrote the script, but you were hands off yeah, and let the, yeah, let yeah, them. Uh, and, exactly. Uh, you know, I was watching rushes and, you know, giving, opinions and thoughts and proposals but no i wasn't really you know, apart from being involved in casting the principals uh you know genevieve o'reilly was brilliant and 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 some of the other principals uh the three or four lead roles uh, jason watkins was brilliant he's a fantastic uh, actor um, yeah great man too and uh yeah so those people i was involved in casting um but not not all the other parts um so at this stage in your life, what what do you think are the kind of projects still left for Stuart Urban to tackle or that you want well, to 
well, like, you know, oh, what have you? Tell you what, there's, whatever, there's, there's always one, isn't there? That whatever I can get is the answer. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, yeah. there's so many times you try and make like, for example, I have a huge project with a fantastic cast on Neville Chamberlain, uh, the British Prime Minister, Hitler, and what happened before the Second World War. And mm -hmm. I had St Stephen. Um, uh, Stephen Fry as the Foreign Secretary. I had James Fox as the British Ambassador. People who were reading the script without an offer, they just loved it. I could never make it because it was a different take on appeasement, you know, uh, and when is it right to fight? And it was basically trying to look at really what happened there. Uh, and uh, people didn't want to make it, you know, it was just, just didn't want to make it because it wasn't the standard story of British triumph over <laughs> tragedy and uh, British uh, success. Um, mm. So, yeah, I would make that if I could. And there's some other projects we had that I really wanted to make. Um, but right now I have an offer to direct an exciting thriller series in South Africa of all six episodes. And that doesn't, that kind of stuff doesn't come along a lot. So, so I basically would like to keep as active, as active as I can doing things that I care about, you know, maybe as a, you know, in that case, it's as a director, for hire, uh, but also my own project. I have a uh, techno thriller, which is related to AI, uh, uh, a bit like Megan, but with a, a drone, um, which is, right. uh, uh, it was been optioned by for a lot of money at one point. I sold the spec script, but I got it back. They couldn't make it because the pandemic. Um, and I'm still hoping to make that. I'm speaking to a few people. Uh, but you know, so I can't tell you what might happen or not. You never know in the business, as you, as you know yourself. So, so sure. uh, yeah, I'm hoping, yeah, to be in South Africa for most of next year, directing this. Um, uh, it, it, in between the the projects that you've done and the little jobs as well, what what do you do work wise to you know keep the lights on? Well, it was it, ever since uh, the secret. Mm. I have no problem. In, in getting development deals to, to to write what I'd like to write, you know, right. uh, this year has been a bit tougher. I mean, normally it's a stream of uh, things where I could really not exactly choose exactly what I get paid to write, but more or less for seven years. But this right. year has been a contraction in commissioning, and uh, the market is contracting. Um, but uh, you know, this there's other stuff that might well happen writing wise shortly um which should tide me over next year uh, with an exciting uh, some writing missions and commissions so i love writing you know it's it's um much more difficult than directing though is <laughs> my, my general do you view. think so i i mean i i find the opposite is true really? because every yeah. every film set is different you the, yeah. the actors you're working with are different there's always different dynamics and on set politics or offset production well, exactly as you heard from what i was saying um uh, but in a right with as a writer it's you in a room with a keyboard yeah um, i suppose i've been fortunate in writing that i've never lost a script to someone else or been fired as a writer or you know had to sort of um i've been fortunate that i'd be able to create my work whether i direct it or not and, and do it successfully and that things that i didn't direct were still successful so so i suppose it's you know and I got a lot of it made as well, what I wrote. So, so mm. it's, it all depends on your personal experiences and directing. You know, um, when I say it's physically difficult and emotionally straining, of course, because of what you said, things like the pressures and the emotional pressures or clashes. Oh, four o'clock, four o'clock call times, you know, all of that fun all stuff. That night shooting. Uh, yeah. And if I do this thing in South Africa next year, it's like it's 65 days of shooting. With one week off in the middle you know it's pretty serious it's kind of like a right. studio style you know shoot but without as many days off uh, like doing a big movie um so um well you know uh i'm sure i'll be all right if i get it so i, I mean I, I, another way of summing that up might be that you you keep your fingers in a lot of different pies definitely spin yeah. many plates um uh and like i say uh you know, it's been good to have a living in developing stuff, you know, which at least I can feel mm. like I did this Susie Lamplew documentary, but which was exciting. But but uh, other than that, no, I mean, it's either stuff that I really didn't want to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, but in general, yeah, keeping the lights on 
feeding the family these are these are noble missions and and um you know there's there's obviously been a move to have much more diversity and inclusion and so forth in the business which which is fine but you know means there's less room for the veterans you know you never see a uh, articles in the trade press veteran filmmakers is always upcoming talent you know yeah and uh, it is an yeah. ageist industry in that sense um, it is it is um oh, let's get a vet let's let's let you never see someone announce a new production company to sponsor veteran talent you know it's, it's no your... and um I, you know and I, I, I some people would say that i'm the veteran but i don't consider that all the all the work that i've created it's all been my own more or less well that's so, great but no, it's I mean, it of, is, but yeah, it, 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 uh, you know, I still also need to put the lights on, and those jobs don't tend to pay that well. So yeah. I, it's like, where do I go now to, 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 to try and get my stuff commissioned or whatever? No one is interested in a fifty-something-year-old white guy's voice on anything. I found. Well, um, the other problem is, of course, people don't want to pay for anything. Going back to piracy no. and the contraction, you know it is much more difficult to make a living because, you know, with the royalties and residuals, I think I was telling you, I understand why the writers struck in Hollywood. Yeah. When Netflix, and the actors. Showed, when Netflix showed The Secret. Yeah, and the actors, same kind of deal. Mm. Um, the Secret, I earned 100th when it was shown on Netflix and became well, 10 hits. 100th of what I'd have earned on ITV on a repeat. A, a friend of mine um, just told me um, so a movie called um, Danger Close, which is a, a very good, small budgeted film about uh, a particular group of Australians fighting a battle, the Battle of Lao Tang, I think it is, in, in the early days of Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, he said to me, you won't believe how much Netflix paid for that that movie. And it was a, it had a small cinema release in yeah. Australia, and then it was basically straight onto Netflix. And I said... I don't know, £25,000, which I thought was extremely low, and I thought I must be wrong. And he said, no, 5000 Yeah, yeah, that's the going rate, $5,000. And I, I just thought that's, a, that's obscene. And no that's... one else will take it. You know, if there are any filmmakers out there, you know, don't, if, you, if you're getting an offer like that, it's much better off if your film has any kind of value is putting it on... Um, Tubi. Yeah, on all the... I have an aggregator for my films, a very good distributor who... Uh, uh, indie rights who have earned much, much more than that from preaching to the yeah. birth and, and my other films uh, than over the years. If you add it all up, it's much, much more. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm kind of uh, flaking a bit now, Lance, but um, no, that's fine. Well, I'm just about to say that was my last question. We, we've okay. kind of hit the, we've gone over the 90 minute mark, um, Stuart. Thank well, you so much for for, com for coming really, on. This has I'm been very grateful uh, that anyone is that interested in my career. But hopefully, you have no, more. I'm I, I and I'm I'm going to keep looking at the the things that you do next. And um, if you've ever got a project that you want to promote or or plug um, that's coming up, uh, please give me a shout, and we'll 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 get you yeah. on again. And I'll, I'll Wait, get well, one of my... hopefully, hopefully endangered will happen next year in South Africa. You'll probably read about it if it, if it does. Fantastic. I, I really hope so. Um, everyone watching, thank you so much uh, uh, for coming on and, and checking out. Um, thank you, Stuart, uh, for attending. I'm going to be uh, back on the channel again on uh, Monday and Tuesday. I've got my special coming up on the, the thing where I've got a whole load of guys uh, on Halloween are joining me on the channel. We're going to be talking about John Carpenter's The Thing. And, Great film. Uh, Great film. One of the best... Um, horrors of all time and you it probably is. saw it, you probably saw it on pirate video like me because uh, oh, i think on. i saw it at the cinema when it Did came out. It, was, it was on along for like a with, week along with assault on precinct 13 which is certainly one of my all-time faves yeah uh, that's uh that's a that's a fantastic movie well um thanks everybody for oh, thank um you. checking out and listening to stuart stories there's a gold mine of advice there and i, I listen Matt, i could have asked you another 20 questions but i i really um appreciate your time and i know you're on a different time zone to me so uh thank you so much again for coming on uh thanks everyone for watching don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you all again real soon